Let me introduce the panelists to you. We have, um, from my left, we have Bert from, uh, he leads the PE strategy at Silverhorn. Uh, Silverhorn is an Asia, Pan-Asian alternative asset manager. He previously was an MD at Northstar, and he led more than 500 million of investment in, in, in growth deals in, in the region. To his left, uh, we have Kerry. Kerry is the founder, CEO, and CIO, basically the man at Kemet Capital. Uh, he, Kemet Capital is a family office that specializes in Chinese entrepreneurs that wants to have a, a portal into Southeast Asia and the world. And hopefully he will bring some of those unique insights, slightly different from the LPs and, and GPs perspective that the rest of the panel can, can contribute. To his left, we have um, Thomas. Thomas is a head of Southeast Asia for CDH Investments, $25 billion Pan-Asian um, alternative asset manager with the roots in China. He focuses on Indonesia, Singapore, and Vietnam. 21 years in, in, in the region. Uh, a long time in Singapore, a stint in Vietnam, um, and until last year, he was the chairman for um, uh, the SVCA here in Singapore. And then last to the left is, is Wei Jian. Wei Jian is a uh, managing director at EQT. He looks after their healthcare and technology uh, sectors across APAC, and then obviously also has a focus in, on, on Southeast Asia. And before that, he had a, a number of PE roles, and he was an investment banker even prior to that. So if you don't mind, join me in a round of applause for our panelists, thanking them for their time. Uh, and now let's get started. Let's get started. The role of um, what makes P investors better in Southeast Asia. So before, actually, I wanted to, I don't know if any of you had the chance, but first page of the Financial Times this morning had a really interesting article. China growth to fall behind the rest of Asia for first time since 1990. The World Bank actually predicts 2.8% GDP growth in China for this year. That compares to 8% from last year. And the article keeps on saying that, um, by contrast, and I quote here, economies in East Asia and the Pacific, particularly the export-driven economy in Southeast Asia, are mostly expected to grow faster and have lower inflation in 2022. Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia, government fuel subsidies have held, have helped keep inflation low, Domestic consumption has risen and the region abandoned, as the region abandoned lockdowns earlier. At the same time, higher commodity price um, sparked by global energy crisis have boosted the region export reliant economies. So very, very topical for what we're gonna discuss today. And uh, actually, as a first question, and I'll start with, with Wu Wei Jian. Um, before we get into the, the, the nitty gritty of the macro, what, what role does Southeast Asia play in portfolio construction um, globally? Okay, Mike Tess, yeah. So, so I think when we look at portfolio construction, it's, it's more from a sector perspective in terms of the key sort of four subsectors that we focus on. But I think Southeast Asia as a region on its own, it's, it's so sizable that you, you can't ignore it. And based in Singapore, I think that's where the, the natural coverage would be. So, so we, we see it as a pretty unique opportunity, given it's on its own. I mean, on a combined basis, it would be the fifth largest economy globally, six, seven hundred million people, uh, emerging middle class, and you know, the usual macro trends that, that are pointing all to the right direction. A big digitization sort of tailwind uh, that's driving a lot of changes in the economies. And I think for us as private equity investors, it plays to our strength that markets are somewhat fragmented in a way, so I think that's where we can come in to build platforms across different regions. So I would say it's a very interesting and exciting region for us locally. Great, and, and, and maybe Thomas, do you wanna? Yeah, um, happy to. Um, obviously I agree with you as far as uh, the potential that Southeast Asia holds as a um, group of multiple macroeconomic you know, marketplaces and, and, and opportunity sets. Um, historically, I, I think it's fair to say that Southeast Asia has um, taken a backseat to, from an allocator standpoint, um, relative to, to China and India. Southeast Asia, also from a, from a deal activity standpoint, has accounted for some 10 or 15 percent in the region. Um, when, when China, for instance, accounted for 60, so it was it was clearly not um, getting as uh, quite as much attention and. Um, Part reason is that uh, the region is so fragmented. Um, it lacks depth and, uh, and scale. 
and uh, it's been it's been a complex and inefficient place to be doing business in for most. In fact, um, I remember when I was still with the SVCA, one of our uh, pet projects was to create the first private equity um, performance benchmark for the region, believe it or not. So there's hardly any data out there that would allow an LP sitting somewhere in California to figure out you know, how much capital you're allocating this part of the world and, and, and who to park it with. So some of those challenges have been um, real. And now I think we're in an interesting point in time when, to your article also, right, um, some of the larger markets in the region, China in particular, are facing some headwinds, and which from my perspective, representing a China-focused uh, private equity GP is hopefully just a temporary um, situation. Um, but it's clearly um, resulted in this part of the world um, um, you know, receiving more attention. Um, whether that's sustainable, I think we'll see. Um, deploying into Southeast Asia only because China is down maybe the wrong strategy from a global peace perspective. That's, uh, that's helpful and we appreciate. So you get, you get both sides of the stories as uh, you will we'll do that throughout the panel. Uh, Bert, maybe before we go to Kerry's vantage point with, with the founders, what's your perspective from your GPs and LPs relationships? Yeah, I'm, th- th- thank you, Andrea. I, mean, I, I think we, our view is it's a throwaway comment for us to say that Southeast Asia is our core market uh, because it, it's, it's very much not a monolithic region. Uh, so we would really disaggregate it and say it's really six major private equity markets. And at any given point in time, the relative value shifts depending on uh, you know, depending on especially as the, the capital formation in any given, uh, in any given place. Um, so what we find attractive about Southeast Asia, and it does tie into the macro, I suppose, uh, is that um, for quite some time we're able to find businesses in markets like Vietnam and Indonesia where when you get to the company level, you know, the return on capital for the underlying companies is higher than our, than our required rate of return. Um, and that obviously leaves a lot of uh, margin for error. Uh, and I think what remains to be seen is whether or not as more capital comes into Southeast Asia, if that still remains the case. But so far, um, we find that that dynamic still persists. Uh, and we suspect it's because in spite of you know, the macro tailwinds uh, that, that you would see in, in, in the press and in the four corners of, a, of an economic report, uh, these are not easy markets to find um, to find investments and execute investments and, and find the right partners. Um, so that's the value that, that, that we're trying to bring, and you know, frankly, all of us are probably trying to, to bring. Yeah, yeah no, then well, we're going to go back to the challenges in, 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 in just a second, because I think you, you bring up a very topical, topical um, issue. Before we move on, Kerry, your, your unique vantage point, given your relationship with, with, with founders and founders of founders, Typically, that would come from China. would love to, um, for you to explain to the audience what, what they see in, in Southeast Asia and Singapore. Okay, so, so we're helping um, very successful tech entrepreneurs found their business mostly in China, successfully listed or exit in some point in their career. A lot of them wants to move to Southeast Asia, in particularly Singapore, on a long-term basis. So in, in the beginning, when they're here, they were looking for things to do. I mean, they're trying to feel out of time. So just to give you a different dynamics, I think some of them who, who retire are trying to reapply what they have done successfully in, in China, building out businesses, reapplying their knowledge, bringing not just their capital, but also a very unique plan of mentorship to help new founders here, um, really kickstart their, their, their entire growth in, in the startup economy. So I think this is where I think most of them could really channel that, that, that very unique entrepreneurship experience and bring a lot of deep insight in, in what they, they've gone through their entire career building out unicorns or Dexacon and eventual exit, right? Bring that very unique, very unique insights to the new generation of founders in Southeast Asia of hoping to benefit the entire ecosystem. But obviously we're not here just to do direct. We're also looking at funding the GPs. So when we first started, I think the VC community was still uh, pre-nascent, still building. Uh, we have not shined away from sitting first-time fund, uh, first-time GP. So we have done at least five or six of them. So that itself is also bringing a, a, a lot of uh, buzz into the startup start arena. 
and sharing via the GP or going direct. Uh, I think that that's what we are trying to do here. So it sounds like you're bringing both the capital and in certain cases the capabilities. Did the, I'll, I'll, I'll bridge to, to, to my next question, but maybe keeping carry, did recent events in the region change? Was it a secular trajectory of the, 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 the entrepreneurs in China looking at Southeast Asia? Has that accelerated, decelerated? What's the, what's the latest? given the macro and political environment? Well, uh, we're not dwelling into geopolitics. I think this is a uh, really, uh, you can read it in, in mainstream media. Um, but I, I really want to maybe pick out a point where a, a, a lot of our clients are the first generation Web2 creator. Web2 has reached a stage where it is pretty much mature across many segments. Uh, I think Thomas can attest to it in China in particularly that there are not many opportunities to invest in Web2 but Southeast Asia is different right I mean the, the sort of uh, the, 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 we are lagging the development both in US as well as China so it remains to see that there's still quite a lot of opportunity here to continue to build I, I, the first way have, have been the sort of platform companies like e-commerce e ride hailing but we are still seeing other bits that's developing, like SaaS, logistics, so on and so forth. So, so I, I think Southeast Asia gave us quite a bit of potential in that sense. We, we still some catching up to do before Web2 becomes mature. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Maybe, uh, you know, Thomas, Regina, Bird, whoever, I've read some of the article from the Financial Times. It looks like this is the moment for, for Southeast Asia. Is this too much exuberance? Is this the right amount? Are we at the start of another era? How do we see the, the next few years in, in Southeast Asia? The, the, the big debate on inflation, right? Is inflation simply delayed in Southeast Asia or is inflation, uh, given the commodity price and an export-driven economy, structurally not hitting? Obviously, Whatever answer you'll give, mm. we're going to open a hedge fund right after this meeting. <laughs> but <laughs> long or short, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to kick that off. I mean, I think I, I think what we had seen um, a few years back in, in let's say Indonesia in the last cycle is uh, you know when the rupiah collapses against the dollar, there are a lot of Indonesian companies with the U.S. did a lot denominated debt. debt. Uh, so I mean, just if you take that. Uh, well, you know, well-known example from a few years back. Um, similar examples like that will manifest themselves, I think, in the in the current environment, and it implicates how we how we look on the ground for investments. Um, so it probably goes without saying. I mean, the the macro challenges uh, it, it 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 may, may paint a broad brush for uh, enthusiasm for Southeast Asia, but there are certain very dangerous sectors. Um, you know, we. Uh, we like sectors where, I mean, it's, it's kind of obvious, but sectors driven by domestic demand, uh, companies that are um, companies that are in sectors where the last dollar is likely to be spent. So, you know, if you're a household and you're under you're under financial pressure, it's going to be healthcare, it's going to be education, it's going to be uh, the types of uh, business technologies that make businesses more efficient. Uh, we're not looking for businesses that are that are trying to uh, trying to solve their unit economics with the next round of funding. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's changed how we how we look at deals at the at the micro level, in spite of you know the the uh, the macro the macro tailwinds. Yeah, I agree with that, Bert. I mean, we are clearly having a day in the sun at this at this very point, right? Uh, rarely has the community the looked um, at Southeast Asia so so often and, and, and intently. And uh, thank you, Hong Kong. <laughs> thank you, China. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, and the region is robust. And it, it, macroeconomically speaking, we, we 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 do stack up well. I think relative to many other opportunity sets and markets for the time being. My concern would be that if. And, at this point, right, uh, the, the, the global economy is, is, is deeply intertwined that um, um, as the global macroeconomic uh, environment uh, worsens and capital is gradually withdrawn from the asset class, my experience having done this for a while and been through a couple of cycles is that almost regardless of how relatively attractive a macroeconomic environment 
that capital tends to get withdrawn from the um, from places that are that have higher cost of doing business, that have higher perceived risk, that are more complex and harder to understand um, and and inefficient. And so, Southeast Asia, relative to to large, let's call them mainstream opportunities such as China or India, you know, might end up um, getting penalized, you know, first, if you if you will, you know. Um, whether that is in accordance with the relative attractiveness, attractiveness of the macroeconomic picture or not, um, think of think of what happened. You know, when, when I mean, this is the same with frontier markets. Typically, right, money gets allocated into the into the large tier one, you know, mainstream opportunities first, and then trickles down all the way to so-called frontier. And when money gets withdrawn, you know, it comes back up that way. So I I, I do worry a little bit about that. Maybe we go to the next topic, and, and, and Weijian, maybe we, we start with you. Um, to what extent Southeast Asia is a regional versus a country strategy? Yeah, I think Bert mentioned earlier that it's, it's really unique countries in, in a region. And as much as you want to group them together, I mean, it's, it's obviously each country has its own challenges, regulatory systems, and, and everything in place. But I do think it's, as you sort of move up the scale of your investments, as you try to invest a larger sum, a larger ticket size, writing a larger equity ticket. I think you have to look at more sort of regional companies in nature or even building platforms from scratch, right, in terms of anchoring to one company which where your presence in the, in the market and trying to get that model across. And, and it does apply to all sectors. I think some sectors lend itself better to consolidation or, or you know, platform play. But I think that's increasingly, I think, it's, it's sort of a more interesting trend that we have seen and, and, and execute on. Also, I think during COVID, where, where different markets experience different levels of impact at different times of the cycle, I think that's where having a diversified regional player actually makes a lot of sense. So, so obviously, we do view it as each individual market, but more and more, we try to see whether we can actually combine some of these players to, to form a more regional platform. I think that's where you can benefit from the underlying tailwinds and at the same time get a more diversified exposure. I mean, just, just to react to that, I think that's really, really interesting because, um, uh, and I'll come to why, but we probably take the opposite strategy. Uh, and the reason is that um, we can't find that many companies that successfully regionalize. So a Vietnam company to go to Indonesia is, is hard. Uh, an Indian company to go to Indonesia is, is, is hard. Um, and there are a number of very successful regional players um, but the execution required, I think, requires uh, you know, firms like EQT, which have experience operating in you know, building businesses you know, across the UK, Australia, France, and Germany. Um, but we find that to be quite difficult to do for a lot of investors uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs, more importantly. So the management teams uh, have very strong capabilities in one country within Southeast Asia, but to get them to... Uh, scale that business across borders is, is tough. Um, so what we try to focus on, um, and in ways it's complementary to what you do, uh, is we're trying to find the entrepreneur um, who has a lot of white space in the home market and get it to the point, uh, and we can make our returns uh, in backing those companies and get them to the point where uh, their execution capabilities right, make them the market leader in, uh, in their home country. Because uh, I think in a lot of the Southeast Asian countries in which we operate, uh, the execution ability of a local management team gives you a longer runway, a longer competitive runway than it would in, say, China, uh, you know, where I think the competitive edge can be eroded much more, much, much more quickly. Just a small nuance. I fully agree with you, by the way. Um, uh, you know, Southeast Asia requiring a, a level of depth and specialization from an approach standpoint. Um, what I found, companies expanding, uh, you know, on occasion beyond that country, it only works if they are investing in a less sophisticated environment. So every time my Vietnamese company tries to take their restaurant chain to Singapore, you know, they fail. But when they go into Myanmar, as an example of where a market is less well developed, you know, there management skill is you know, relatively uh, effective in those markets. So that direction, I've personally found it, it working, but not often the case, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would tend to agree, I mean. <laughs> so that's a, a tip, you know, always down that. the ladder of, of I think it also depends on which sectors you, you, you are sort of focused on. 
And it has to be a one that is sort of more easily replicable. So I think maybe just case in point from what I was talking about building a regional platform, we took a Singapore-only sort of corporate services business and expanded it across uh, Asia, uh, mainly Southeast Asia and India. And that's where it's, you can leverage the say core management team in Singapore with the IT backbone that we have created that, that would sort of make all these other companies that we require a lot more efficient. And the service they provide is, is B2B. So it doesn't really depend on changing consumer taste and it's, it's a pretty sticky and stable kind of service that you're providing. I think that would be a lot more easy to build a platform than, let's say, a, a restaurant chain when teas in different yeah. markets are very Based different. profiles, right. But from the perspective of a GP trying to cover the region, right, I mean, I, you think you mentioned six, six viable economies, right? Uh, or oh, no, no, I, I definitely did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> to I me, you know, I said six my, my six, Southeast Asia... Six my, major uh, uh, my, <laughs> my Southeast Asia is two and a half. It's uh, Jabo Databek, it's southern Vietnam, and it's Singapore. Thank you. Why? Obviously, it's to some degree dependent on your own profile as an investor, uh, you know, where do you come from, what's your own scale, what types of opportunities you're looking for. But <clears throat> some of the markets in this part of the world are either subscale. I mean, who bothers with, with Cambodia? Yeah. Sorry for anyone coming <laughs> from Cambodia today. Um, and, uh, and likewise, um, you know, how, how much how accessible are markets like the Philippines or, or, or to some degree Indonesia? Uh, they are uh, borderline incestuous environments and so unless you, uh, I mean look at how few transactions are happening in those from a surface very attractive opportunity sets. So there's only a few markets I think that, 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 that the likes of us can, can break into and, and do business with relatively low entry barriers and those are the, the three that I feel uh, both scalable and sufficiently developed for us to be, you know, executing on an investment program of scale over a five-year time frame. You, well, I agree with what all of you have said. I just want to add on to what we just said. There's, uh, also, sometimes when we look at Southeast Asia, uh, when we notice uh, a, a significant gap in, in, in some sort of model, right? So five years ago, we came to, uh, we were looking around Southeast Asia. E-commerce was booming. All the platform companies were doing well, but then when we, when we dig deeper, where is the express delivery sector? There's none. So we started uh, investing, looking for founding team. We found JNT Express, we found Flash Express, and we, obviously there's a Ninja van in, in Singapore as well. So sometimes you have to create something mm. out of nothing. Right? So I think that, that's also the, the sort of potential Southeast Asia opportunity that can, that can be cross-border. Uh, quite, quite a bit to do with B2B, although there's a certain element of B2C as well. Yeah, but, but you're right, it is far and few. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would add that on successful platforms, they tend to be anyway number one, two, or three in their, in their own, in each of the country where they play, right? Because so it's a collection of national champions or, or platforms. It's great. So um, last thing, and then would love to leave some time for the question, so audience do type up at will. Uh, we've touched uh, tangentially, and, and each one of you had mentioned at least one, but who wants to uh, bring home really some of the challenges in deploying or managing or exiting um, uh, businesses and, and, and de facto executing an investment strategy in, in, in Southeast Asia? Yep. Well, Thomas. The question is challenges. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Nobody seems to have any. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Creely four very successful investors. <laughs> oh, I'd, say, I'd say my main challenge more over the last five, ten years has been finding investment opportunities that uh, met my investment criteria, in particular around um, valuation. Uh, but the secondary market was... Yeah, so, well, <laughs> valuation is the key, though, and so we've 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 tried our best to stay disciplined around you know uh, uh, terms and, and valuations in particular, and as a result, have had to um, slow down our pace of deploying capital here in the more recent past. And uh, to the point of earlier, you know, fragmentation and lack of depth, I think that's still um, you know an issue, at least for. 
um, you know, mid-market private equity, let's yeah. just say. I can't speak for VC, of course, yeah. I think, it, I think a big challenge is deploying at scale with a systematic strategy. So there's the, the cycles in any given country tends to be short, uh, and the capital flows can be so fast uh, that you know, deploy, deploy large checks, I, I think, is, uh, is difficult. Because when a market gets hot, certain funds will come, and it becomes a very competitive process. And all the advantages, I think, a lot of the advantages get priced away. And then if you look at the smaller investments, you really need to commit to having a strategy to have a portfolio of relatively small investments across six major private equity markets, or two and a half if you, if you, if you subscribe to, uh, to Thomas's view. Um, and I think that, that that requires a certain level of institutional um, dynamism and commitment. Uh, and I think a lot of institutional investors have the luxury of, of scale. It's a high-class problem. And they don't necessarily want to commit to a portfolio of small, growthy investments in, um, you know, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Yeah, I think from, from my perspective, I think it's, I think, echoing what Bert and, and Thomas have mentioned is really finding opportunities of scale that fits our sort of sector requirements and our investment requirements and I guess the market is not as deep as we would like, but I think that's, that's in itself a challenge and also something that probably can sort of add value by creating platforms and trying to put things together and, and really trying to create something. And I think that's the approach that we would continue to go going forward, really building on certain key sector expertise and, and really drilling down into that rather than being too opportunistic and going where the money flows. I think that's not something in our own my own personal DNA as well as our firm's DNA to do so, and it's, it's, I think that's where we might have to wait out and, and sometimes in, when, when markets are too hot, or you have to find angles where you could be sort of the more value partner that you can underwrite uh, sort of a higher growth case than, than others. Fair enough. All right. You know, um, no disrespect to the GPs next to me, but uh, I, I think you guys have been too successful selling the macro picture of Southeast Asia <laughs> to the point that, that that macro potential gets stuck with the, the, the management company, the founders, etc. Everyone's asking for this sort of valuation, right? Where we, we all know it's six different markets and, and the market depth, the scale is actually nothing compared to US or, or China, but they're asking for at least twice, if not three times the multiple what we've seen elsewhere. I think that, that's, that's the adjustment that we, we need to see. Obviously, this is a relative safe haven in today's uh, rather macro uncertainty. Uh, Southeast Asia seems to be doing okay, but who, who knows, right? Um, so we're still waiting for the, 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 we sh- we the should window. Be, I hope the next panel will be a bit more bearish so that <laughs> we can test valuation. <laughs> uh, no, that's a good, that's a good uh, point, Kerry. And, um, Maybe we go to some of the questions that have popped up here. Thank you for, um, for submitting them. <laughs> Do you see an opportunity to bring investors from China with revel- relevant experience to invest in Southeast Asia? I think they're already here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hello. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, Hill House, Primavera, Boyu, uh, ourselves, CDH, of course, PAG, a lot of... Uh, Historically, more uh, North Asia, China-focused um, uh, GPs broadening their mandate, or at least you know uh, allocating resources in, in, into Southeast Asia, right. working on I think their mandates for the next funds to potentially include this part of the world uh, more openly. It's my view. Yeah. So yes, there is an opportunity. Yeah, a lot of GPs are here, as, as Thomas uh, uh, mentioned, but uh, we also saw a lot of CVCs. Corporate VC funds. I think first way we all know Alibaba came many years ago, took out Lazada. So that that wave has continued, and and the founders has come. So they are here, right? They are here. So we also start to see the sort of ecosystem becoming more vibrant. Um, um, a lot of companies are, are actually Chinese led, Chinese sponsored, uh, GPs, founders fund, or what have you not. Um, and the experience they bring alongside is actually quite, quite uh, immense because they, they, they think about building a company in scale. So there's a lot of commitment to invest massively in the early stage to take things out in scale very quickly. And, 
and two, the, the sort of experience that they have, um, for example, I'm always marveled by the engineering team, right, uh, of, of these companies. Uh, first thing they do is they, they'll build a 300-man engineer team in Beijing. That's, that's day one, right? And then they'll develop the app, they'll develop the system, and then they'll go and penetrate Southeast Asia. So they think in, in terms of different scale, different, different sort of potential. It, it's sort of a, the, the typical go big or go home sort of um, mm. um, um, philosophy. Uh, but it really create a lot of competition in, in Southeast Asia, as I, as I see it. But I see it as constructive, because over the long run, we'll create really true, uh, highly competitive companies, if not for this region, but for global. Yeah. Um, I'm, yeah, from my vantage point, we've seen some of our clients we advise actually having literally lifting and shifting teams from, uh, from China. So not only adding Southeast Asia to their strategy, but in certain, at least maybe in the short term, diverting some of that mm. uh, bandwidth and, and resources to Southeast Asia. We'll see whether that's permanent or, or likely uh, temporary. I, I think if I could just add there, I, I was thinking about it. I mean, I think that there's a, there's a pretty nuanced question, actually, because um, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we're seeing, they're really looking for a specific partner, not a firm, but actually a partner who has some experience that will help the company through what is likely going to be a challenging operating environment. Um, so we have an entrepreneur who would say, we would love to have an investor who can bring in the logistics team at JD. Um, we want that guy on our board. Um, but I'm not sure, I mean, I think, I, I think it's, I mean, obviously there's, a, there's a, China's a very developed private equity um, <coughs> market. Um, but, but, but I think it really is actually a, qu a pretty micro question as to whether or not some of the larger China-focused firms that are here that were mentioned by, uh, by my colleagues um, are going to necessarily be able to convince the entrepreneurs mm. uh, that they bring the value right. now. I don't think for, for the entrepreneurs that we want to back, it's not just about money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, that's a very valid point. Maybe last one. Um, are you convinced about the valuations in the PE VC market over the last two years? If no, how did you operate in the last two years? Yeah, what did you do? If there's no deals here, you keep complaining there are no deals, so why, why, are, why, are, why are you being paid all this money? <laughs> yeah, I've been selling like crazy. So, uh, I mean, I, you know, yeah, I've, been, I've, I've spent all my time exiting companies in the last uh, two years, in fact. Yeah, so. yeah, I think do you want to... For, for, for us, I think uh, we, we exited a company last year, but we also invested in the two companies, and both were actually proprietary discussions where we brought in some angle that we thought it wasn't like a wide option. I think where we see a little bit more dislocation in terms of valuation is more in the VC, more late stage VC growth stage. Right? I think that's where we we look at a lot of companies and, and were considering whether they are actually fit for P investment, but unfortunately, I think it just didn't work out for us. So that's where we continue to pay attention to because we think that some of these companies will eventually mature and be PE investable, but as of now, I think, uh, I think that's where I think the run-up has been the most intense. So being more proactive, that's how you try to uh, steer away from the valuations that yeah, we're more discussing. proactive and I think sector focus will be identify come from that we think we can bring in our own angle right? and, and see better. I think that's where Bert mentioned as well. You, as a partner, you want to bring in more than just capital. If it's just paying the highest price, then it's, it's not something that you, yeah. will be sustainable.